Okay. Hi, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Welcome back uh, to Cafe Ole, or welcome to those of you who have um, who haven't participated before. My name is Jay Rosen. I am a volunteer here with Nefesh Benefesh. I myself made Aliyah um, with them almost 15 years ago. And here at Cafe Ole, we go over the everyday Hebrew you need here in Israel. Uh, not necessarily the Hebrew you're learning in Ulpan, or for that matter, in day school or university or your previous trips here in Israel. This is really to go over um, everyday Hebrew, um, making sure that you are best, um, Sorry, just making sure the logistics here are all right. Um, great. Um, making sure that you as Lim, and Lim by choice, as I also like to uh, categorize us, uh, are best prepared and set us, ourselves up for success here in Israel um, by understanding the everyday things that we probably take for granted in our respective countries of origin, right? Like going grocery shopping or paying bills or understanding the news or just how to communicate in general. And oftentimes when we can't speak the language, even though we certainly feel at home here, that can be really frustrating to the point of what am I doing here and really a, a major form of stress. So we really try to go over everyday topics here and we also um, want to hear from you. What topics do you want us to go over? Um, not specific to you individually, but to, but specific to Olim, right? So instead of how do I communicate with my specific bank, words for banking in general, right? Let's think about more than just ourselves, but each other while we're doing this. Um, as always, if you have any questions while I'm uh, teaching and going through today's topic, please write, um, if they have to do with the topic at hand, please write them in the Q&A. Um, section. You can see that in the um, toolbar, the menu bar here on Zoom by pressing Q&A. If you have any other questions, any other comments with regards to Cafe Ole, myself, anything else, please put that in the chat window. Um, it's just me and right now there's 81 of you. So please be kind. Q&A is just about this lesson. Anything else is for the chat uh, button. Likewise, you'll get a copy of this uh, recording of this lesson on Nefesh Benefesh's YouTube channel. So um, whether or not you keep up, whether or not you wanna take notes while I'm writing or screenshot um, the words that we're gonna go through today, um, you can always go back and review it on demand. Just type in Nefesh Benefesh at youtube.com. You'll come up um, this lesson and all previous lessons from the last, uh, in, the, in the next day or so it should come up. So with that, um, we're going to go over a topic I know many of you have requested, I know is a source of frustration for many of us. I remember this very well, nearly 15 years ago, having to repeat over and over again to finally understand what was going on is those pesky automated phone menus, right? Whether we're paying a bill on the phone or we have to do something on the phone and whether it's our bank or it's our our um, HMO or it's our municipality or it's some other utility bill, or it's a telemarketer, whatever it may be. Automated phone menus have been around for a while in Israel. Um, they can be quite frustrating when you don't speak the language and it's everything sounds therefore like they're speaking very fast. What we're gonna do today is dissect the phone menus because eight times out of 10, they're using the exact same vocabulary. It may not be in the exact same order, each phone menu, right? It certainly is not going to be for the same provider, and we're not going over those, right? So if your specific issue is making an appointment with an allergist, like we talked about last week, or some other specialist doctor, we're not going to do that today, okay? There's met too many of you, there's only one of me, and I'm not a human dictionary, right? As we talked about before. So I'm not going to go through the things you can easily look up. What I am going to do is give you a cheat sheet of what are the major words and functions and commands that are being said to you in Hebrew on those automated phone menus that you can quickly understand and navigate yourself through it, no matter if you're calling the bank, um, your medical, whatever it may be, the, we're gonna go through the major words. Okay. Now, obviously this is gonna be done over the phone. So it's a different um, dynamic in this class, right? Just because I'm writing it down, you're not necessarily going to have this in front of you as you're listening. It's important just to keep in mind the words that we go over, 
how they're spoken, um, and, and a general sense of how to navigate a phone menu and what to listen for as the context clue uh, to tell you what's going on. Okay, so with that, I'm going to share my screen. And there we go. So as always, the um, Hebrew with the bars and dots indicating vowel sounds are on the right-hand side. Transliteration is next to it, followed by the English, followed by any important notes that I don't um, go through, or maybe I will as we go through our words together. Okay, so what we're going through is when you have to call into somewhere, your bank, your doctor, your um, electric bill, your any kind of utility bill, or anything where you have to call, and there's an automated menu, right? In Hebrew, the word for automated menu is nituv sichot. And you're going to hear this said at the beginning. Um, there will usually be some sort of introduction, and then they'll say something about um, something along the lines of here is the menu. Menu in Hebrew is tafrit, tafrit, depending on how you say the letter resh. Uh, nituv sichot. Nituv sichot, it literally means a phone call routing. Nituv means routing, like to route something, and natav is a router. So those of you who already live here in Israel and have an internet router at home, that's called a natav in proper Hebrew, not a rautel, even though people call it that. Um, and sichot are conversations, but in this context, they mean phone calls, right? The word that we use for it is an automated attendant. It's, that's the old fashioned word for an automated phone menu, right? So instead of picking up and immediately talking to someone, you have all those options, right? Just like we have in our respective countries of origin. Um, uh, to complete, to make a transaction, press one. To speak to a customer representative, press two, right? For other languages, press three. You know how it goes, right? Here, we're going to go through them in Hebrew for a, um, a uh, important reason. Um, and this is an important one to understand as recent olim, as future olim, Many of these places might have an English option. Chances are the actual automated menu is not going to be in English. And or the person who speaks to you on the other side is gonna have really, really basic English. Okay, so uh, sorry to burst your bubble, but just because um, one of these automated phone menus says for English, press two, it doesn't actually mean you're gonna get full service in English. At some point, the English is gonna stop and it's gonna be Hebrew. Okay, so instead of being frustrated and freezing on the spot, like I said before, here's what you're going to listen to, very carefully listen to, and as they're saying it in Hebrew, know what to do next. So let's go through some of the most common words you're going to hear again and again, um, and you can use this for future times the next time you're on a phone call or before you get on one of these calls to see um, what is going on. Okay, so the very first one we've talked about before but it's important because you're gonna hear this again. Um, automated phone menus is one of the few places you're going to hear um, very formal Hebrew and very polite Hebrew at that. You're gonna hear the word ana or simply na. Both of these words mean please, right? They mean bevakasha, but it's a very formal way to say it. First off, it's easier, right? Cause it's only one or two syllables, um, but it's a very formal way to request something from someone. Right? You would not say Anna to a friend. You would not say Anna even to a parent um, or a colleague at work. This is very formal Hebrew. Usually you'll get it in the form of a letter or um, certainly in a much more formal setting. Like the only place I can think of is like a court, right? Um, but certainly on phones and automated menus on the two sichot, you're going to hear this um, word Anna. And it's going to be before telling you to do something. And here's our very first one. Uh, actually, it's numbers four and five. Four and five, um, often in dictionaries, will get um, uh, translated as dial. They don't quite mean dial. Literally, um, together, figuratively, they both mean dial. But what you're going to hear oftentimes, right when you call uh, an itu sichot, is you're going to need to put in some number, or it's going to tell you to press something. And it's going to say to you, Ana Hakishu. Ana, we just said before, was please, right? And then it's going to say Hakishu. Hakishu, as it says here, is the command form. And we've done the command form in the past. 
Hebrew has its own conjugation for the command. Excuse me. Hakishu is the plural mixed gender for form of the verb lehakesh, which is to press. And when I say to press, it's like to press a button. It's used when you press a doorbell, um, to press anything on um, a, a button. So it's thinking of a phone that either has individual buttons or on your touch screen. Okay, so when it says hakishu, it's simply telling you to press, okay, or to dial. We would normally say in American English, dial, not necessarily press. And usually the automated menus, that certainly in America, are for English, press one. Please press one, right? So it's the same thing here. It's saying the same thing. Um, but hakishu can also mean dial. And that gets us to our next word. And an important distinction needs to be made here. The next word is chaigu. Chaigu is also a verb. It's also in the command form. Chaigu means dial. Now, what's the difference between the previous one and this one? Chaigu comes from the word chug. Chug is a, um, we use it in everyday Hebrew to mean an extracurricular club, like an after-school club, but it also means, refers to a circle or something circular. And chaigu refers to the old rotary phones that some of you may remember. Remember where you had a um, wheel in the middle and you had to dial by rotating the wheel for each number that you wanted and each one had a certain was on a certain part of it and took a little bit longer for one and a little bit shorter for others, right? That's the word that we used up until the advent of button phones and smartphones to dial. It was chaigu because you had to literally, you had to do a rotary dial, right? So it has to do with that circle, that rotary um, distinction. In modern Hebrew, while both of the terms get um, mixed up with one another, right? You'll often hear hakishu or chaigu, there is an important distinction, and I want you to pay attention to this because this will save you a lot of frustration. When an automated menu tells you hakishu, it's keeping you in the system and it's telling you just to simply press a button or two, or as you're about to see your two number or your any your bank account number, whatever it may be. If an automated menu is telling you to haigu, it's telling you to hang up and dial again. Okay, very important. Hakishu is please dial the following within that automated system, right? Please press one or please press, please type in your two number. Haigu is telling you to hang up and dial a new number, right? So if you call your Kupatrolim, your HMO, and it's telling you, leave the code Corona, Haigu, Kohavit, Stein Schmone, FSFS. For corona tests, please dial asterisk 2800. It's telling you to hang up and dial again that number, right? So when you see billboards in Israel and they give you a number to call, it's not saying hakishu, it's saying chaigu. It's telling you dial this number, right? So when you see the word or hear the word chaigu, it's telling you to dial from scratch. Hakishu means you're gonna go through the system that you've already called. Okay, a small distinction, but a very important one that hopefully will save you some frustration when you call one of these automated phone menus. Uh, the next word, the next two words are very important on a phone menu you have on your phone. It's going to tell you oftentimes, um, for example, Ana hakishu et misspelu Please dial or please press your tu number. Ulesiyum kochavit or lesiyum sulamit. What does that lesium kochavit or sulamit means, right? It's telling you to dial your tudatsu number. You figured that part out, right? Your national ID number. And then it's saying something about lesium and then these two other words. Lesium means at and at the end and at the completion of. It comes from the verb lesayem to finish. And then it says two things, kochavit and sulamit. Kochavit is that button on the bottom left of your phone menu. That is asterisk in Hebrew, right? Kochavit comes from the word kochav, which means star, because an asterisk, according to the Hebrew language, looks like a star, which it does. And the other one on the bottom right of your phone menu is sulamit. Sulamit is the pound sign. Sulamit comes from the word sulam, which means a ladder, right? Because as opposed to the other one, according to the Hebrew language, we think it looks like a piece of a ladder. 
So Sulamit, pound sign is on the right hand side. Okay, very important. You're going to hear these words again and again. Kochavit, Sulamit. Okay, a lot of um, phone numbers in Israel don't begin with 1 800. Instead, they'll begin with an asterisk, a Kochavit, and they're usually three or four letters, three or four numbers, excuse me. Um, that's our abbreviated um, phone numbers here in Israel. A lot of major companies have their own. Um, and a lot of ways after you input a series of numbers, it's going to tell you to put Sulamit as a pause in um, what you have typed in. Okay, next word. Very important word. Um, just like English has the difference between a number and a digit, right? A digit is the actual sign that indicates a number. So same thing in Hebrew. We have the word mispar, mispar, which means number. And then we have the word sifra. Sifra is one digit. Svarot are digits, right? And often you'll hear this. Ana hakishu et arba svarot achonot shel kartisa shrei shelcha. Please dial the last four digits of your credit card number. Okay, that's what it's asking you to do. And it says Sparot. It's not some anything else. It has to do with numbers. It's just the digits, not the numbers, right? The digit is the actual sign that we use in a respective language. So that's the word. Sparot, digits. Sifra, one digit. And we get to a very important last digit is Sifrat Bikoret, number row nine here. Okay, Sifrat Bikoret is what we call in English a security digit. And let me explain what this is. All, each, every Israeli citizen has what we call a Tudat Zerud, a national ID, right? And our national ID has a nine digit number. That is your Mispar Tudat Zerud. That is your number that you use for everything. Um, Think of it like a social security number for Americans, but you use it so much more frequently than a social security number. Um, and it's unique to you. It's very hard to um, fake or to use in another context. So um, it's used quite frequently. Now you can tell some things from a Tudatsu number. For example, if you made Aliyah recently, it usually begins with the numbers three and two. If you were born in Israel, it usually begins with a zero. Um, I think if you're from the former Soviet Union, it begins with a two. There's a couple of different variations there, but the point is it's a nine digit number and the last number, it has other meanings that again, we don't necessarily know as civilians, except the last number. That ninth digit is what we call the Sifrat Bikoret. It's the security digit. It has something to do in um, cryptography when you're creating new codes and new numbers that are meant to be individualized that last number is randomized, right? It's created randomly in order to provide further security to that number. So oftentimes, especially older companies, when they ask you to put in your two, that's a good number, it's gonna sound like this, pay attention. Ana hakishu et mispar teudat azarut kolel sifrat abikoret ulesiyum sulamit. You've probably all heard that 500 times before, right? Um, please dial, please press your to that Zehut number, including the security digit, followed by the pound sign. Now, if you look at your two that Zehut, certainly the old ones, those big floppy disk size ones, and I think also the new ones, the credit card size ones, you'll see that the last digit has a slight space to it between the eighth and ninth digits, it's a slight space. That's because this is the Sifrat to be called, the security digit. It doesn't have to do with your personal ID that's, big, that's embedded in that number, it's a random digit that's assigned to you to keep your number safe. Okay, so that's what it's asking you when it, when it says kolel sifrat bikoret, and it will ask you. Okay, so you put in your information, right? Ana hakishu et mispal teudat azerut, mispal kartisa shrei, Mispal Dalkon, all sorts of different Mispalim, right? Your Tildat Zewut number, your credit card number, your passport number. What's going to happen next? Well, what's going to happen next is going to give you a whole bunch of options, as it always does. And all of these options, excuse me, are going to be in what we call the gerund. And we've talked about this word before. The gerund, or the verbal noun, are verbs that end with ing. 
right? Going, doing, making, saying, talking. Um, and all of these um, options are gonna be phrased as such. I'm not gonna go through all of them because they are different for each company, but the big ones you're probably looking for are, the, are coming up right now. The first one is le kabbalat meda al, right? You're gonna hear this a lot. For example, uh, when you call kupat cholim, when you call your HMO, it's often gonna say le kabbalat meda al chisune shapat. For more information on flu vaccines, ana hakishu, or I was just gonna say hakishu achat. Okay? Um, le kabbalat meda al. Kabbalah means reception. The act of receiving, the act of lekabel. If lekabel, which means to get or to receive, is the infinitive, kabbalah is its verbal noun version. It's the the um, as we say in Hebrew, shema peula, the noun that's that has to do with the activity being done, right? To in English we would normally hear to get information on, but in Hebrew we use the gerund. So. For information, for receiving information about, meda is information, al is on or about, and then you're gonna to listen to whatever's specific for you, right? We're not gonna go through every automated menu that exists in Israel. These are the actions that the vast majority of them have, and then you're gonna to listen to the one that's specific for you because you're gonna look up the word on your own that's specific for you, what you need to find out information about or to get done. Okay, but this is the most general one you'll hear. This is the next one that's very important. And we've talked about this a lot. I always get questions about this. Do it, we'll do it now. I'm sure we're gonna cover this again multiple times in the future, but please pay attention. If you've ever wanted to make an appointment in Israel, the next few minutes are really crucial. Okay, if you're trying to make an appointment with your doctor, with a nurse, with a lawyer, with a service representative, with anyone, you're going to listen for the words lezimun tor, hakishu, blah, blah, blah. Okay, lezimun tor or lezimun tor, hakishu, blah, blah, blah. Lezimun tor, lezimun, again, zimun is a gerund. It comes from the same root as lehasbin, to invite or to order. Um, it also comes from the same root as zman, uh, time. And this is best translated, and Torah is both a line, but it's also a Q, a C-U-E, right? So it's to make an appointment. Lezimun to means to make an appointment. Don't try to um, literally translate this. Lezimun is usually meant for a subpoena or a summons or um, something very serious on that kind. But the idea is to make a time, um, to make space in time in a very metaphysical way, but also not. Um, and a toll means a cue as in an appointment, right? So if you're listening to an automated menu and you want to, you want the option to make an appointment, it's going to ask you, lezimun tor hakishu blah, blah, blah. Okay, very important. That's what it's going to say. Please don't interrupt or type in the Q&A, but wait a minute, I thought you say this a different way. I'm going to tell you how you're going to request it. This is how they're asking you, right? As it says here on the screen, for the service provider asking you, it's gonna say lezimun tor. If you are speaking to someone, whether it's on this phone menu or in person, or you happen to reach directly through to someone, you're gonna say something different. And you're gonna say the following if you need to make an appointment. Ani rotze, or for a man, ani rotza for a woman, likboa tor. Okay. I want to make an appointment, as in I directly, the person wanting the service is asking for it, is going to say, Ani rotze, or Ani rotza, likboa to. Okay. If someone is asking you, the person who's giving you service, or is hopefully going to give you service, is asking you if you want to make an appointment, they're often going to say in those automated menus, lezimun to. Okay, so again, if you get through the customer representative, and we'll get to that word in just a second, if you're speaking to someone in person, whatever it may be, the way we say for ourselves to make an appointment is likboa tor. Okay, likboa literally means to fix or to affix something. And tor, again, is that word that means both a line, a cue, and also an appointment. 
Okay, so very important distinction. Le zimun tol is what they're going to say on those automated menus, and or le zimun gisha, or le zimun mifgash, whatever it's going to be, the verb it's going to tell you to pay attention to is zimun. When you are asking for a tol or a mifgash or a gisha, a meeting, you're going to use the verb likboa. Okay, very important distinction. Then it's going to say, hopefully, at the towards the end of that automated menu, right at the end of that nitzuv uh, sichot, lenetzig shirut or lenetzigei shirut hakishu tesha or efes or something along those lines. For a netzig shirut or netzigei shirut, netzig shirut is customer representative or service representative. A netzig is a representative, a male representative, and shirut service. Okay, Netzig Shirut is one service representative. Netzige Shirut is a compound word. Both of them are compound word. Netzige Shirut is simply the plural and it means service representatives, right? So if you're looking to speak to someone directly, you're gonna wanna listen to Le Netzig Shirut when you hear that option. And sometimes it'll be phrased as Le Netzige Shirut. Hakishu, and then it's gonna tell you to do something. Okay, excuse me. And then you're going to get whatever you press, right? Whether it's to make an appointment, for accounts, for bills, for buying something to make a reservation, it's going to tell you the following thing. Ana hamtino or Ana hamtin. Okay, Ana we already had, was please. Hamtin is, these are both commands. Hamtin is the singular version, hamtino is the plural, is wait. Okay, this is telling you to please wait. Right? Just like we have in English, just like we have in other countries, oftentimes you get to a certain point in the automated menu, it's going to tell you, please wait. And then the music, elevator music is going to chime in, um, and who knows how long you're going to wait. Okay, so oftentimes it can be a long time, sometimes it'll be short, but the point is it's going to tell you, Ana Hamtino. Um, and even a customer representative, once you speak to them, will often tell you, Ana Hamten, or Ana eh, Hamtini, to a woman. Okay, but just it, just that you know that is the cue to wait and your turn will come up, right? And then each company has its own wait music. Some of them are better than others. I'm a personal fan of Banque Lumi's music, um, but everyone has their own um, flavor and, and genre of music that they like. Okay, let's say you got this far and you got to please wait. That's already amazing, right? To get to please wait, that already means that you went through at least one command successfully through that menu. That's a really good job. Kola as we say in Hebrew, very well done. What happens when you are gonna to speak to someone or get moved to somewhere? Oftentimes it's gonna prompt you, just like Ana Hamtinu, right? Please wait. It's gonna say, Hinchem um, le. Especially when you've been on hold, right? And they turn you to a customer, um, to a service representative. Uh, before they actually make that uh, that connection through the service, they're going to say, um, Thank you for waiting. You are being transferred to a customer representative. Okay? So, Thank you for waiting. Inchem um, Inchem comes from the word um, hine. It's very formal Hebrew. Um, uh, you, are, you are hereby, you can translate it as, right? Very formal Hebrew, very polite Hebrew. You wouldn't speak like this all the time. You certainly wouldn't speak like this to friends. Inchem, you are hereby. Muavarim, uh, muavarim, transferred, or are being transferred. Okay, it comes from the verb laha'avil, to transfer. Muavarim is the uh, participle, you are being transferred. It's the um, both the uh, participle and it's also the passive form of it. You are being transferred, le, to, usually it's a netzig shirut. You are being transferred to a customer representative, inchem muavarim, le netzig shirut. Okay? All right, so you've gotten all the way there. You hopefully get someone, um, and let's say they speak a little bit of English. Let's say they don't. The point though is you already have your list of vocab that's specific to your needs. You already know what to ask, right? So if it's getting a referral, 
if it's buying something, whatever it is. Now we're gonna do something definitely connected to speaking on the phone, but slightly different. It's not gonna be the automated menu. It's what you actually do on the phone, right? So up till now, everything has been automated. Everything was an automated menu, choose your own adventure, press here, press there, wait, you're being transferred. You're talking to the person and let's say it doesn't go well. What do you do? Well, just like in other countries, if things aren't going well with the customer representative, you often ask to speak with their manager. How do you say that in Hebrew? Here's how you're gonna do it, row 17, right? You're speaking to someone, it's not going well, you wanna escalate this or you think that they're not doing a good job, you wanna to speak to their supervisor. Here's what you're gonna say, and also how you're gonna say it. Listen to how I say it, and then we'll go through the words together. Okay, what do we say? Ani, I, rotze, or rotza, depending on who's speaking. So for me, I would say rotze. Female would say rotza. I want le dabel to speak im with ha menahel shelcha, or shelach. Now, menahel means boss, or manager, or supervisor. Um, I'm not trying to be. Um, misogynist here or sexist in assuming that the minahel is not a minahelet, is not a um, woman, but is a man, only because, again, as we've talked about many times, the default in Hebrew is always male, okay? It doesn't mean that you're, you're um, not going to speak to a minahelet, a woman supervisor. It's just understood that the default will always be minahel regardless of the person's actual gender, because you don't know it yet, right? The supervisor could be a woman, could be a man, you don't know yet, you're just simply gonna say minahel. Okay, you could certainly say minahelet, but minahel is the safe default that most people are expecting you to say. Okay, and then if you can tell the gender of the person to whom you're speaking, or if they address themselves to you and told you their name, or at least the name they go by on the phone, you either will say shelcha to a man, or shelach to a woman. Okay, so all through it again. Ani rotze or ani rotza le daber im hamenahel or hamenahelet shelcha shelach. Okay, I want to speak to your manager, and it's very important that you say it with confidence and with um, uh, with assurance. Uh, is self assurance or in confidence is better the word. Right? Don't say it like um, with up talk where it sounds like a question and it goes up in tone at the end, right? This is a declarative statement. I'm mad. I want to speak to your manager right now. Okay? I said it fast. You can say it slow and it's still all right. Okay? Full stop. And that's what you would say if you need to escalate something on the phone. Good to have in your arsenal when you're on the phone, not just everything we went through and not just the, the specific vocabulary you need. Now, here's another part of talking on the phone that often happens to me, and I'm sure it happens to a lot of you, is what happens when you are in a meeting or it's the middle of the day and you get a random call, right? And it's either uh, it's someone doing fundraising or it's an actual service provider you have. Oftentimes for me, it's insurance agents, um, but it could also be my healthcare. It could also be all sorts of other things, right? And they call me in the middle of the day and the tactic, just like they use in other countries, the telemarketer will start talking really fast and really politely so that you have no choice but to reply or at the very least hear the little bit of their shtick in order to be sucked in. What if you just don't have time to be sucked in? What if um, you just want to say, I'm busy at the moment? Um, if it's irrelevant to you, just hang up, obviously. But if it is relevant to you, if it isn't relevant, hang up. Excuse me. But if it is relevant, what do you say? You're going to say the following. Sorry, or mitzta'el, or mitzta'elet. Sorry is sorry. We can say that. We say that in modern Hebrew. Or mitzta'el for a man, mitzta'elet for a woman, which means um, to be sorry for something. 
So um, let's say it's the insurance agent calling again, like, and they're trying to offer me something and they're talking really fast. And I say, sorry, slicha, ani asukirega. Sorry, apologies, I'm busy at the moment. Ani, I, asuk, for man, asuka, for a woman, busy, kirega, at the moment. Okay, sorry, ani asukirega. And then it will usually be followed by the next line. If Again, if it's relevant to you and you want the, the service that they're providing or you need to further talk about it, efshar lachzor elai, or efshar lachzor elai, efshar, or efshar, we've talked about before, it means um, is it possible, or can you, or would you? Um, this is a very polite way to ask for something. Efshar lachzor. Lachzor means to return. But in this respect, it's meaning uh, to call back. And elai to me, right? Efshar lachzor elai literally means, um, would it be possible for you to return back to me or come to come back to me? But it's really saying, can you call me back, right? This is how you say, can you call me back? Efshar lachzor elai. You can use this, by the way, in other contexts where you need to say, can you call me back? Efshar lachzor elai. Okay, that's what you can say to them. And another very important one as not just Olim, but as consumers in Israel. Um, and this happens to a lot of us, right? Let's say it's an insurance agent, or let's say it's our cell phone provider or some other provider that's trying to offer us something and they're talking really fast and we get flustered and we get frustrated that we think we understand, but we don't. And we simply say yes to something and we don't really know what we signed up for, right? Very common in Israel, even for native Israelis for this to happen. How do you ensure that doesn't happen? I get this a lot with insurance, again, where they'll start offering me a policy over the phone, and I have to stop them, and I say, okay, again, that very polite way to, to say something or to request something, could you, would you, is it possible? To send, mail, mail, just like it sounds, the English word means email. Okay, very important in modern Hebrew, mail, only refers to email. It does not refer to postal mail. Postal mail, we still use the old word doar or doal, but mail is the, the shorter form of how we would say email and assuming that, right? So again, um, uh, insurance agent is giving me some statistics or some stats for a new policy. And I tell them, I say this for two reasons. One, because often I'm not ready to take that call. Um, I'm in the middle of something. But another thing that's very important, and this has changed since I made Aliyah, but it's very important for all of you. Many service providers will not give you what you are requesting or what they're offering you in writing. Um, I remember way back when, when you signed up for a credit card, uh, for a phone, um, cell phone plan, they would take a blank piece of paper and scribble out all sorts of numbers on it and give that to you as the formal offer. That's not, that's not the way you do anything. It's clear that they're making up the numbers, right? Instead of there being an actual set number, they're putting it on a scrap of paper that could easily be thrown out and a new set of numbers gets set, right? Because it's just a scrap of paper. It's not the letterhead of that company with their information on it and with a number on it that you can go back to and say, well, you offered me this price. And then you have the actual proof, right? So anytime you ask, can, I, can you send this to me my email? You're signaling to the person, number one, I actually want to spend the time to read this, but also I want to review it. How many of us actually buy something without reviewing the details? Hopefully not many of us, right? Certainly when it comes to things like insurance policies or cell phone plans or internet plans or telephone deals or TV cable plans, whatever it may be, right? Very important that you get things in writing. And oftentimes the tactic of telemarketers and the operators that you're speaking to through this automated phone service is to talk so fast to you and throw so many numbers and figures at you that you simply say yes or you hang up. And hopefully you do the former and then they got you. But there's no documentation of the number that they gave you. And then when you go back to negotiate or cancel that plan, there's no documentation of that ever taking place. So always ask for things the mail. Certainly not by fax. We don't do that anymore in Israel, thank God. Um, but if shali shloach the mail, 
very important um, line to have under you. Okay, like I said, this was really general, but really important for you to navigate those automated phone menus. Because again, they're gonna use the same words. Some of them use the exact same language and the exact same um, menu, and then they just plug in their specific things, right? Um, but this will get you through everything. Banks, your HMO, making a reservation at a restaurant, paying a bill, making a reservation anywhere else. Really important um, set of words here. Okay, I see we have a bunch of questions. Um, uh, John corrects me, I am speaking with my American accent that the pound sign is what we call the Sulamit, the hash sign is what they call it in British English. Fair enough, those of you who are Brits, I was not speaking about the currency sign, I was talking about the thing on the phone, if you didn't catch we were talking about phone menus this whole time. But yes, British English, they call it a hash, English, American English, we call it um, the pound sign. Thank you for that distinction. Okay, if you have any questions, please write it in the um, Q&A button as, um, as I pause here and look over the other questions that we have. All right. um, Lila just asked about how to ask the automated system for a live representative. We just talked about that. Right, we just talked about that word here in row 14. First off, in an automated menu, you're never gonna ask. They're gonna give you options, but you're gonna listen to le netzig chez When you hear le netzig chez route, row 14 here, that is a customer representative. That is a live voice, okay? It means the same exact thing in, in Hebrew as it does in English for a customer representative or service representative, press blah, blah, blah. That's what, that's what you're listening for if you wanna to speak to someone directly. Okay. Um, SR, can you show the last two lines again? Yes, I can. Okay, they're back on the screen. Okay, okay. Um, can you come back to me? Can you call me back? And can you send this by email? Two very good lines to have whenever you're speaking on the phone to someone. Okay. Um, Esther asks, is it important to have personal email in Hebrew or English is acceptable? Not sure what you mean, Esther, but um, your email address is your email address. Um, uh, uh, Hebrew uh, email addresses in Israel are still written out in Latin letters. Um, so, and just like with all email, you'll be able to get in both Hebrew and English. Um, but certainly, if you're speaking to a customer representative in Israel, they're going to send you information in Hebrew, um, regardless, because it's, yeah. I hope that answered your question. Any other questions with regards um, to, can you please repeat what you said? Um, Jenna, I'm not sure to what you're referring, but if it was about email addresses, um, email addresses in Hebrew are, um, email addresses in Hebrew are, um, a, in Latin letters, regardless if you're writing and corresponding in Hebrew or any other language. Um, we have websites now in Hebrew in Israel that you can write out in Hebrew letters, but when it comes to email addresses, they're still in Latin letters. Ah, Lila, how can we ask for a copy by snail mail? Uh, you can, you can say, Efshar lishloch bedoal, right? Instead of mail, excuse me, let me just close this off, right? Uh, row 20, instead of saying Efshar lishloch bemail, which means email, can you please send this by email? You can simply say, Efshar lishloch bedoar, or bedoar. Doar, doar is snail mail, is regular post mail, postal mail, right? Um, and then they'll ask uh, for your totet, your address. 
Um, most places won't do that um, simply because it's cheaper to send by email, but you, it doesn't hurt to ask. Okay, but great question. Okay, sorry, just going through questions that we're getting right now. Um, Hebrew emails are also phone numbers. I don't quite know what you mean, Miriam. Please let me know please, if you can give me some more details about that. Um, could you please repeat those different numbers for different kinds of olim and tudatsuhud and what they're used for? It's really not important. Um, just know that your nine digit number has a lot of information about you. Most of the details of which we don't actually know. All that I know that I've discerned from public, um, from open source data is that usually the first one or two digits in your tudatsuhud number indicate whether you were born in Israel or you made aliyah. And if so, at what time of um, Israel's existence, you made Aliyah. Okay. Um, Howard asks, do all business emails have the suffix IL? Uh, not necessarily, Howard. It depends to whom you are writing. Remember that IL is a domain name for um, uh, websites. Not all websites in Israel necessarily end with the co.il. Many do, uh, but not all of them do. So it depends on the company that you're emailing, um, that if it has it or not. Um, Maria asks, isn't there another word for wait? There is indeed, Maria. There are two verbs in Hebrew that mean to wait. One is lechakot and one is lehamtin. In the context of waiting in line or in waiting on the phone for a service representative, they're going to use the verb lehamtin. Okay? But very important, there are two words for it. Miriam asks, um, okay, Miriam, I, that's not a very common thing to come across, but I, I have seen that before, where it's your phone number and then the email address, but this is far out of my expertise. I can't help you more than that. But if that's um, how some email addresses work, great. I, that's, I'm, I'm not tech-minded enough to know what that, what that means. Um, other questions? Just make sure I got through all of the major ones here. Ian Michael asks, is there a way to have the prompt repeated? Great question. Oftentimes, and listen to how I say it, because again, it's not necessarily worth writing this out because this is all going to be oral on the phone, right? Um, it's going to say something along the lines of lechazara betafrit or lechazara betafrit, right? Lechazara comes from the verb lachzor, which we just had before, and tafrit is a menu, right? To return to the menu, press something, something. Usually that will be the last option, just like it is in other countries. Um, so it'll say lechazara, be, lechazara betafrit hakishu tesha. Okay, for to return to the menu, press nine. That's usually what it will say to have the prompt repeated. Okay. Um, Carol asks, is the word sorry for sorry often used? Yes, it is. Um, we have a lot of English and specifically American English that's in everyday Hebrew, but sorry will be absolutely understood if not used. Um, but if it's not, then mitzta'el, for I am sorry, or mitnatzel, which means apologies, or I apologize. Okay. Okay. Cam asks a very great question. What about slicha? Okay, slicha is an important um, distinction. Slicha, we often translate as sorry. It really means excuse me. And you could use it here. You could say slicha an yasuk kirega, and that would be perfectly all right. But it's not sorry. It's excuse me. It literally means forgiveness. It's not the same as sorry, right? This isn't um, 
British English where we say sorry every other word, or certain people in my family who say sorry every other word, and it gets a bit ah, because you're not sorry, you're just using that as a placeholder. Um, slicha is very formal, and it really means excuse me or forgiveness. So if someone is talking very fast and you want to interrupt them, that's a good way to say it. Slicha ani kirega. I'm sorry, excuse, we would translate into English as sorry, but we're really saying, excuse me, I'm actually quite busy right now. Okay, as a means to stop them doing it. But slicha isn't exactly sorry in the literal sense. It is in the figurative sense. Okay, great question though. Okay. Okay. Any last questions? Any last questions about anything else? Um, not necessarily the list that we, um, the words that we went through today, but any in the last few minutes that we have here together. Um, Jeanette, why would Israelis behind the counter always laugh when I would say, Is that overly formal or polite? Great, great question, Jeanette. We've talked about this before, always worth repeating. Slicha efshar lekabel is incorrect Hebrew, and that's why they're laughing at you. Unfortunately, they're laughing instead of correcting you and nicely correcting you. In Hebrew, and this is very important, folks, because I know we're all very polite olim from Western countries. It is not that manners don't exist in Israel. They absolutely do. The word efshar is very polite, as is the word slicha. You never, ever, ever use the two words in the same sentence. Okay, in English, we would say that. Would you, would it be possible to pass the sugar, please? Would you please pass the sugar? In Hebrew, we do not speak like that. Okay, both words are polite enough on their own. You don't put the two together. It's improper Hebrew. Okay, so you would either say, as Jeanette's um, question, and this is a really good one because I know a lot of us face this, because we're translating literally from English in our heads into Hebrew. Doesn't work like that. Okay? You would say, um, something, or, um, or something along those lines, something along those lines, but it's very over the top in politeness. Um, it's not that Israelis aren't polite and can't be polite. It's just, it's clear you are translating from um, Hebrew. It also comes off as rather passive aggressive to say, um, excuse me, could you please, could I please get something? Um, it's, it's making it sound like they're otherwise incapable of doing it. And it could be they're incapable because they're not paying attention to you as the consumer, as the customer. Um, it just comes off as, as so passive aggressive, it's gruff. So you can just say slicha or if shown. Okay. And that also goes for the other word that um, Americans in particular, but um, Westerners, Brits, Canadians, other English speakers like to use a lot, which is bevakasha, please. Right? You're not going to use if shall and bevakasha in the same sentence either. You're going to use one or the other. Okay. But um, exactly. Jeanette says well, I would make it even worse. Please don't follow what Jeanette is doing. She's giving us all very important public service announcements. Um, thank you, Jeanette, for that. Carol, does dachuf mean urgent and also push? Great question. Dachuf, dalid, chet, vav, pesofit means urgent. It literally means pushed. Mitchof is to push something. Dachuf is urgent. It's the participle form of mitrof, so something that's pushed is urgent. It needs to be pushed through. Okay, so dachuf means urgent in Hebrew, and mitrof means to push. Um, that was actually one of those words I always wanted to know, and I couldn't figure out until I moved to Israel, or basic words like push and pull, right? We use all the time, but we don't, because we're often learning Hebrew in other contexts other than everyday language, we don't often learn the words for push and pull until we're in Israel. So to push, litchof, to pull, limshoch, right? So should you be waiting in line, let's say for a bus or something along those lines, and people start shoving, you will often hear people say, don't push. 
and you, you won't say it as politely as that. You'll say, Loli trof, don't push. That's how you would say it correctly. So someone will stop pushing you. Um, Miriam, you will say, um, you can simply start, can, can I get or give me or pass me? You can simply say, if shall. If shall, if shall, sukar, if shall, melach. Um, don't, what, another thing that Anglos often do is that they'll translate from the English and they'll use the verb um, yachol, which means can or able, right? So the, the thinking in English, could you pass something? And they'll say, ata yachol la virli et a melach. Okay, would you, could you transfer, could you pass me the, the salt? Um, it doesn't translate well. And it, and it, and it shows your uh, immigrant status very well. And simply just say, Evshal, right? Evshal melach, Evshal ta melach, Evshal et ha melach, or Evshal melach, either way indicates, could I have the, um, could I have the salt please? Right? Two words say a lot more um, than all those words in English. Okay. Okay. Thank you all so much. Um, really appreciate it. I see that some of you also wrote in some good um, topics for future lessons. If you have any other suggestions for topics, please write them in. Um, send them in by mail. We learned that word today. Mail to Nefesh Benefesh. We'll be happy to go over them um, in, in the future. If you have any other future uh, topics, we'll be happy to go over this. You'll also, like I said, get a recording of this lesson on YouTube, on Nefesh Benefesh's YouTube channel today, tomorrow or the day after. You'll be able to go through all these words, pause the screens, um, take a screenshot if you need it, write down the words, go through this as many times as you want. So you have it in um, for posterity, save it in your bookmarks, also on YouTube. So you can always go back to this one because again, you really will go over automated menus all the time. Um, once again, thank you all for joining, and I will see you all next week. Little.